Thank you very much. I prepared a few uh, slides. First thing that I found interesting today, I remembered uh, the ecology classes that I had at the university. We always start by vocabulary and we define uh, ecosystem. Ecosystem, uh, biosynthesis in a biotop, and it's true that a biotop has supposed to have very clear limits. A lake uh, is usually the case because we are told that you have the water and then you have uh, the land and it's a clear image between water and land. And then we have uh, systems uh, like this one today, like the Grand Lieu system, and uh, we realized that the limit is not as clear as we thought, and it's quite the contrary because we have a transition area between uh, between the water and uh, the wetland, and it's what makes this uh, system rich. It's the ecotone area between the water and the land. So we saw uh, very rich uh, in terms of inhabitants. We talked about birds a lot. I thought about uh, the non-vertebrate animals. We are told that uh, three-quarter, four-fifths of the animals are uh, non-vertebrated uh, animals, but when we look at the balance, when we look at the biodiversity, we don't really talk about them. There are the left outs of that. Maybe it's a bit more difficult to talk about them, but maybe there is hope with techniques that could uh, be developed, like the environmental DNA, for instance, even though today it's uh, very early to talk about this technique. What we saw uh, today is that uh, this uh, system is related to its watershed, and the watershed is really the possibility we have to make an influence, to have an influence, an impact on the lake ecosystems. It's what was illustrated this morning, and there is something else that uh, was uh, striking, is that you could have a very big difference between the... Um, the places where pollutions are created and the lakes where they end up when there are nitrates or um, it's because of sprays and uh, so it's not uh, related to the watershed uh, quality it's more related to the sprays that are used in the farming areas so what I wanted to say is that things are all connected and it's not connected on a biological way it's also we also have a biosynthesis that is in this uh, one uh, system. We had two very good examples, one with the Buick uh, swarm that was um, described in the presentation in the Netherlands, and uh, the one that talked about the portrait talks that uh, we heard just before lunch. These uh, migrating species or connection dashes between uh, different areas. There are meta-population. Technically, we could even wonder if we are not talking about meta-communities for some uh, populations. When I look at this list, I realize that there are clear synergies between a uh, very uh, lake ecosystem and uh, upstream uh, rivers. I work in um, the upstream river area in the Rhine River, and we have different uh, systems. We have a lot of access to work on. And we also uh, work on the groundwater, and so everything, all the synergies are important. In the end, what is also interesting, something else that we talked about, you can disagree with me, but uh, I feel that we have uh, very, very different uh, habitats. One difference is related to the structure, but one is related to the way they work. And maybe we could wonder if we have uh, one system, one example. We use one word, lake, to uh, put them all in one box, but 
Maybe we could wonder if uh, what they have in common in terms of structure and functioning. If we ask that question, what comes behind it is is uh, looking at lakes uh, in the framework of the water framework uh, directive. Is it something realistic? Why? Well, because the, this water framework directive, it's analyzing a mass of water based to a reference, and very often the reference is a, it's a place where everything goes well. And since every place is unique, and because we have different kind of pressures on the different places, we could also talk about the historical reference, but we saw today that the historical reference can become extremely complex and uh, we can do whatever we want. So we will never get back to what it was before. We are not going to be able to travel through time. It was a question they asked this morning. Is there hope if we uh, try to get back to, what, to the way it was before? And it was clearly no. We do not have a resilience level that is strong enough to go back in the past. Now we can have another issue about the tools that are used, the tools that are mentioned in the water directive, because they don't take into account the variety of uh, systems that we have. The importance of the ecotones in assessing the ecological quality, we all agree on that. Structure and function, it works. We also talked about uh, ecosystem services. I'm not going to go back to that. And we also talked about uh, water regulation, and because what guarantees the survival of these ecotones is water, and the level of water has changed. We heard that changes that seem the most uh, relevant in terms of ecology follow the climate evolution. And when we try to get rid of these climate changes, evolutions, then we, with a set um, system, set scheme, then we, we can say that we are losing in terms of biodiversity because maybe, because this system between, uh, about interfaces between land and water is not made to have a regular functioning. We also talked a lot about quantity and quality when we talked about tidal levels, and the quality level is extremely, the notion is extremely important. And here, the difference is not only spatial, it's also time related. It's Olivier that uh, mentioned that before. It was the last sentence in my slide, in my keynote. We can have uh, long lasting um, effects related to an event that never uh, happened again. So today with uh, nitrogen, with phosphorus, we have a lot of uh, stock in the sediments of these uh, pollutants. Even if today we stopped using phosphorus and nitrogen, it is very likely that the habitats will still have uh, the way to work, the way of working of a non-natural system because it takes uh, decades to, um, to fix the pollutants. When we are here, we can start wondering what are the ways we have to act to, and to find the way we have the ways we have to act. Then we have a very simple way of thinking. We're going to find uh, ways to control in order to find ways to answer the questions. So physics, for instance, very often it's related to nutrients. So we have to look at the KPIs. And what we realized today is that there were strong retroactions in the biological element. There are two elements that were presented. The first one um, in the chain uh, with myocastors, I know halophyte and water birds. That uh, means that uh, we have a cascading effect. F one action from the um, myocastors has an impact on every other item in the chain. And the other one was the American crawfish having an effect 
on um, micro fights and then having an effect on water birds. And when we look at that, the key species that are the root of these changes are invasive species, and we talked a lot about them today. Even in the example about New Zealand, uh, it was um, based on these mussels that we mentioned, and it had an impact on the rest, and that's a good question for me. What does it mean? Do it, does it mean that we have to live with them? Should we accept that? Should we integrate them psychologically uh, as being part of the ecosystem? and accept without tolerating them, but accepting that they are here in the in the system. It won't be possible for all of them, because there is a European regulation with a list of species that was uh, produced at mid, uh, in the middle of July 2016. There would be an obligation for uh, European states to uh, act, to take measures. It's the case for myocastors. And we have uh, an obligation until 2019 to roll out action plans. And for other species, it's a good question to ask ourselves. Could we consider them as part of the ecosystem? And let's go back. There was a point where there was no um, not type of bird. And we realized that some birds arrived within the 20th century. But they were not considered as exotic species. We have just accepted them and integrated them and we consider that they are part of the system. And today we regret that their population is decreasing. We could also try to wonder if we could live with them, if we connect them to the Water Framework Directive. We talk a lot about pressure, biological pressure, but there could be a biotic pressure. We talked a lot about cyanobacteria, we talked about botulism, and we also talked about uh, invasive species pressure. And these items are important because they have an impact on all of the habitats. I'm almost done. We still have time, no worries. So you also remember the medical words that we use. I don't know if it's frustration for us not to have been doctors, but we are worrying about the health of uh, ecosystem. We are talking about the health. We are running diagnosis. We consider them as super organisms, super bodies. The organs that are part of it are all connected. They are flux. And when we act on something, it has an impact on everything else. So here, when we use these words, it's a key item to have an ecosystemic approach. And this approach, integration approach, seems uh, all the more important to me because it seems difficult today for us to make the difference between what is related to anthropization, so human pollution, and what is related to natural evolution. It is normal that a water ecosystem changes and gets more and more nutrients, nutrients throughout time. And when you look at a pond, a pond uh, will be to become wetland. It's, it's normal life. And so what are we ready to accept on a large-scale ecosystem? And could we today make a distinction between something that is natural and what is related to forcing, related to human activity that could be considered as uh, problems? And to, to find answers to these questions, I think that today it's important to carry out studies on the long term to work in terms of trajectories. We have to also find a way to build synergies, to work uh, with different professionals from different fields. And we need to find interfaces to find ways to work together. And uh, it means that we need to get together around the table, like today, and to speak to each other. And we need to work uh, in large scale to open our scopes, to change the way we look at the space and even time. 
I will conclude by uh, saying that uh, these systems are very sensitive to climate changes. And it is uh, something that was uh, an idea that, gave, uh, that Olivier gave me, the um, impact that could have some extreme events, climatic events, when there are cyanobacteria in one place, they will be there forever. And the fact that at one point they appear, this pressure um, works so the cyanobacteria arriving, it happens regularly, but at some point we have all the circumstances needed to have an explosion of the cyanobacteria. And from that point on, we know that they're here to stay. So, but the extreme events that uh, created this situation today just happen once and maybe it will never happen again. And we have a list of events like that that happen once and that have a lasting impact. And it was very well illustrated in the botulism peak. We can have uh, one particular event that will have an impact uh, on the long term. That's it. Thank you very much. I think that uh, right now we have a presentation of the pictures. It was uh, scheduled. Should I give the floor to the organizers?